Children, you are dismissed to go down to that once again winter wonderland of shoots and ladders. Is that right, Cammie? Yep. You want to go? I bet you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please open your hand out. And if you've got a Bible, um, we're going to probably move around a little bit. But if you want to open up to a passage so your Bible is in front of you, in case I start to say things that, that make you tired, you can uh, look down at chapter 12 and just meditate on some of the, the text that we're going to look at from there. Uh, let me do just one real quick a couple things here. This is called a chasuble. For some of you, uh, we typically only wear these on the seven principal feast days. Uh, but today it seemed kind of fitting, largely because Tanny and Adam bought this because I said I didn't have one. So they got one so I would wear it. The chasuble uh, is something that comes from early Christian history. Paul may be referring to the chasuble when he asks Timothy to bring his cloak from Troas. Because it was essentially a poncho that they wore, that Roman men wore. And uh, it was worn in the church by the priests. Well, when it goes out of a fashion in the early church, in the, in the culture, the church still retained it. And the priests would wear this when they were celebrating at the Eucharist and then started to decorate them. That way, when they were raided, one of the reasons, when they were raided by the, the Roman authorities, everybody could scatter and only the priests would get arrested. That's where it comes from. And that's one of the reasons it was kept. Theologically, it's to depict the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So it was kind of fitting to have a big blanket on today uh, that's pink, I mean rose, <laughs> because of the, the joy of the Lord that's supposed to wrap us up. Amen. So let's continue with the, uh, the theme, the series that we've been in. As we're in Lent and we're engaging in conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and how the Holy Spirit leads us into those conflicts. But today, like we've done the past couple weeks, not generically talking about the flesh or generically talking about the world, uh, but getting specific, we're going to be specific here and talking about falsity in the church. It could be a false church, it could be false parishes within a larger church. It, or it, could, or it could just be principally the falsity in our own hearts. And how we contend with that spiritually, one must be a spiritual conflict. We can't engage it any other way. I had a, uh, a North Korean man yesterday at the, 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 the men's event uh, email me his method of spiritual warfare praying. And it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'll share that with some of the intercessors at another time. But I bring it up because we cannot engage the powers of the age and their influence in the church in any other way than spiritually. Even though they may make use of mechanisms to impact, the, to impact us and to impact righteousness in the church in a negative way, we can't respond with the arm of the flesh, because that always fails. We can only respond, and should only respond, in the Spirit. So let's begin by looking at falsity in the church, because the New Testament says a great deal about it. The New Testament wouldn't warn us about false Christs and false prophets and lying signs and wonders and deception if it wasn't real, if it wasn't possible. Jesus wouldn't speak so much about deception if it wasn't real because he was standing in a nation that was blinded by the very law that God gave them to him when that law should have showed them that he was coming. So point one this morning. The source of this conflict is an, un a conflict is an unholy triad. It's a perverted kind of trinity. And I don't even like re re relating it to the trinity. I, I, I dislike even the, 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 the verbal comparison there. But it's an unholy triad. And so we see this beginning in Revelation 12. Look at verse 17. No, you, you're right, Father Mitch. I need to, I need to back up for a second. I, we won't read it, but at the beginning of Revelation 12, there's the woman who's standing on the... She's standing on the moon. 
She's covered with the sun. She's clothed with the sun with 12 stars around her head, and she's, in, she's pregnant. She gives birth to Jesus. And the dragon comes to destroy Jesus. Well, then the, the child is caught to heaven. He ascends to heaven, and the dragon is thrown out of heaven by Michael and the angels. And this is all very apocalyptic. Be a good movie if they could get the graphics right. And the, 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 the dragon's thrown down, and the dragon is furious because he can't kill the child, and he, now he can't kill the woman because the woman was given wings by God to fly away to a safe place. Yes, there's history in that, because Herod was the dragon who tried to kill Christ at his birth, but God, through the angelic messengers, sent Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus to a safe place. So there's a real his history behind it, but there's a spiritual principle at work as well. Christ cannot be touched in any way, having been exalted to heaven, but the other offspring of the woman those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, we can be attacked by the dragon. So beginning in verse 17, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten horns on his Ten crowns on his horns and blasphemous names on its head. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So the dragon, the devil, raises up a beast out of the sea. And then he gives that beast authority, power, dominion, and a throne to sit from where he rules. And he's blasphemous, but he's mighty. In fact, he's as mighty as the dragon. Josh, why do things like holy water have uh, some sort of efficacious impact on people who are diabolically afflicted? No. Okay, all right. Because people ask that question. They want to know, Nick, why does holy water do something like that? Because it's a, it's a demon. So why would something like holy water cause the person who has a demon in them to react the way that they do. Well, it's kind of hard to explain scripturally, but we see the principles at work many places. For example, in the Old Covenant, when God wants to be in the midst of His people and live with them as their king, where does He put His presence but in a box? And His presence, He is, is in the box in such a powerful way that centuries after He has put Himself in the box and He gets moved the wrong way on the back of a cart and somebody who is not authorized reaches out to steady Him, He dies. There's something about the dynamic interaction between the spiritual world and the natural world that is it's not that it's indissoluble, but there's a union there that goes beyond our regular scientific explanations other than to say something happens when the spiritual, spiritual, spiritual persons, uh, spiritual um, identities, uh, entities, if you will, when they associate and attach themselves with the material world are now interacting as themselves with the material world in the same way that God was in the Ark of the Covenant. And I could go through other passages of the law, other portions of the Old Testament, and show you where this is taking place. But what about holy water? Why does it affect somebody who's afflicted with a demon? Because that holy water has been exercised and consecrated. It's been united to the power and the kingly rule of Jesus in a particular way that other things are not. And so when that water that is participating in that kingly rule, like that water in the font out there when you go out, touches somebody who is afflicted with a demon because now the demon has restricted or focused his person in the physical, physical nature of the person he's dealing with. When that holy water hits him, there's a reaction. When you come forward to receive Christ in the sacrament, you're genuinely receiving the body and blood of Jesus, not just a metaphor or a bare symbol. Christ is working through it in a very particular and concrete way. Revelation is telling us that this dragon who is a spiritual entity is going to focus himself through into a beast. What is a beast? 
all through the prophets of the Old Testament and depicted again here in the book of Revelation. Beasts are nations and empires. They are imperial power. They are state legislatures. They're presidents, they're governors, they're kings, they're emperors, they're dictators. The dragon will give his power and authority and throne to a beast so that that beast can kill the children of the woman that he can't touch. But it's not enough because the dragon is full of wrath that Michael has shut him out of heaven. So then John says, I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. This beast is not like the first one, because the first beast speaks to imperial power, state power, if you will. This beast is a religious beast. This beast comes off as something sacrificial, as something gentle, as something kind, thus the horns like a lamb, because lambs were used in sacrifice. And what's this, the, the title that the Revelation uses over and over for our Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God. Here this second beast is pretentious, pretending to be like Christ. But he speaks like the spirit that animates him, the dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast. It performs great signs, making fire come down from, from heaven to earth in front of people. And it's by these signs that it deceives the nations. We are awash and a secularism that denies the supernatural, and we have been for a very long time. As a matter of fact, we have so been culturally awash in a naturalism that denies the supernatural, the spiritual power and character of God, that the church has adopted that belief that God doesn't do anything miraculous. So think about the swaths of humanity that are primed to believe something that looks like Jesus that can call lightning bolts from the sky in front of all of them because they've been trained to believe that miracles don't happen. And so the moment they begin to see miracles like that taking place, they will follow the beasts. But you see, you have the unholy triad. You've got the dragon and the two beasts. But they do something quite particular, and we see this in Revelation 17. John says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This is the first beast. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Guess what these first two beasts are effective at doing? They are effective at destroying the children of the woman. We don't believe that kind of stuff happens because we don't watch the news, at least Christian news. The number of people who were martyred in the 20th century exceeds by hundreds of thousands the number of people that were martyred in the early church. The book of Revelation tells us that the beasts are successful, both in their work of deception and in the martyrdoms that they create. But notice that it's not the beast who has the blood of the martyrs in a chalice, which is a perverse inversion of the Eucharist. It's the woman. And this is not the woman from Revelation 12 who is the mother of the church, or who is the church who is our mother, if you will. It's not that woman. This is the false church. This is the corrupt church that wears the colors of the bishops, that walks around with the golden rings on her fingers, with a chalice full of God's saints, their blood. And she's riding the beast. She's supported by the empires of the world. And she's supported by false religion. And one of the characteristics about her is her finery and her debauchery, her sexual immorality. You see, it's the imitation of the true that's always the most dangerous. There's a reason we buy fake Oakleys, right? 
fake sunglasses. You know, you go get the sunglasses. They're like $300. But you go down to the ball game and you got the knockoff pair for 20 bucks. I'll take them. When you're a teenager, right, you're in middle school, man. When I was in middle school, well, elementary school, we had to get them, uh, no, it was middle school. I don't know, it was a while ago. We had to get them shoes that you pumped up. Remember those? You pump them on the tongue. And they, they get tight around your ankle and you could run faster and jump higher. At least that's what we were told because it, they said it on TV. It was true. The imitate, and you would go get the knockoffs, right, because they were cheaper. Why? Because the imitation is hard to see sometimes. You don't identify it right away. The only, as a matter of fact, it's so powerfully persuasive, the only way to identify it quickly is by a sudden infusion of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. That's the only way to see it. And there are times that God gives us that, and there's times that He doesn't. Let me give you a, I don't even know if I should share this. I'm going to share it. Okay, years ago, I had a friend uh, she was in the process of going to be discipled by um, some, somebody who had a ministry out in the Midwest somewhere. I didn't know anything about it other than I was, I was at my favorite place. Who was it? It was either you or you. It was you. I was at my favorite place. I was at a restaurant, just any general place, and I was eating because that's what I do when I'm in a restaurant. And, the, and there was a fellow there who was telling me about this about because it was a mutual friend going to be discipled. And as I was eating my shrimp, I had that sudden infusion of knowledge, suddenly aware, this is a cult. And I said to the guy, I said, that's a cult. And I didn't know anything about it. I said, why is she going to go out there with these people that are, that's a cult leader? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I, I hadn't thought about it. He said, yeah, it is a cult. I said, well, who's going to tell her not to do it? Oh, well, nobody's going to say anything. Why? And so then I went and talked to a couple other uh, leaders, and I said, I, uh, this is a cult. Where are you getting that from, Daryl? Well, I, I think it's something the Lord, you know, I, I just know it. I just know it. You all know my good friend, Mike Coppola, Father Mike now. Mike, we were going down to a meeting where uh, a bunch of our other friends were going to be, and this fella came recommended by other spiritual people. You understand what I'm saying? This wasn't like a fly-by-night thing. And so we're in the car, Mike and I, we pull up, we're getting out of the parking. He, he goes to open up the passenger door. He sees this guy, and he sees the, the, this mutual friend. He pulls the door shut, and he says, Daryl, that guy's a cult leader. Never met him. I said, yeah, well, there's what I needed to know. We got out of the car, and I went up, and I told her, I said, I don't think you ought to do this. Well, what do you mean? The Lord's put it all together. It's all coming. I said, I don't think you should do this. I know, I know that no one else has told you this, but I think you're in for a shipwreck. This is a cultic thing you need to stay away from. And thanks be to God, she didn't go. What grieved me wasn't that she had been, that she was going to go do something she thought was beneficial, because we all do that. What grieved me is that no one wanted to say anything. No one wanted to call it out, especially because of the way that this guy was prized and valued by some other very significant people. Deception is powerful. The imitation of the true is so persuasive, we don't perceive it instantly, and we often don't get it unless we get a sudden infusion of divine knowledge. And I wish that I could tell you that every time somebody came to ask me for counsel, in this case, she didn't, but when people just come and ask me, I wish I could tell you I get an infusion of divine knowledge. It doesn't work that way because God's made the church in interdependent. But this thing shows up like Jesus. And we've got to be able to discern it for what it is and then have the courage to say something about it. Secondly, what does this triad producing a false church do? Their influence produces a disobedient discipleship. Why was the Lord sending Samuel to go anoint David to be king? Didn't he already anoint a king? Here's a stunning bit of history here, Grayson. God already sent the prophet Samuel, who, by the way, is the only prophet in the Old Testament. The Scripture says God ne never let a single word of his fall to the ground. Everything he said, God confirmed and did. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. God's already sent Samuel to anoint Saul. Why is now this prophet who's got a perfect track record being sent to go anoint somebody else, let alone a kid, even if he is ruddy in the sheep, with the sheep? Because of this. Because of Saul. You see, God sent Saul to make war against Amalek. 
if you were in morning prayer a couple, couple days ago or you were reading morning prayer, you noticed in Scripture that God says that he will be at war with Amalek perpetually. So God sends David to go, or, uh, Saul to go fight the, the people of Amalek and specifically to kill Agag, their king. Saul goes and is victorious, but then he spares the best sheep and he spares Agag. And then he starts to offer his own sacrifices. Samuel shows up and he says, what's going on? I have been faithful to God. I have done what the Lord commanded. And Samuel, being the prophet who doesn't take lip from kings, says that what is this bleeding of sheep that I'm hearing in my ears? Like, maybe you think I'm dumb, O king, but I can clearly see and hear you didn't do what the Lord told you to do. And then Saul who does not repent, says, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. And so Scripture says one of these phrases that's still puzzling and very, very, very scary. The Lord regretted. The Lord regretted. Listen to me, my friends. Never live in such a way that God regrets you. Well, he just loves us. Okay, yes, he loves you, but he regrets that he elevated you. He regrets that he put you forward. He, re- he regrets that he let you draw near to him. Well, well hold on, dear. I, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you not think that the Lord regretted Judas's decisions? Even though he knew it needed to happen that way? The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king. You know, that's not a denial of God's sovereignty at all. It speaks to God's participation with us right now. That he's working with you right now. He's he's working in your faithfulness right now. He's summoning you nearer to him right now. And he wants us to be faithful. But Saul was a disobedient disciple. So much so that God rejects him from being king. God rejects him from having what God wanted. God wanted to raise him up and give him so much. But he took it away because of his disobedient discipleship. And Samuel, the prophet, says to him, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Do you think that the woman who's sitting on top of the beast, dressed in fine garments with goblets of gold and silver in her hand, feels that she's being disobedient to God? No. In fact, she's living in the blessing that God said she would have. She's drinking from wells that she didn't dig. She's harvesting from vineyards that she didn't plant. She's in houses that she didn't build. She's the head and not the tail. God has raised her up and made her leader in the house. And she's a prophetess. If you go back to Revelation 2 and 3. No. That influence produces a disobedient discipleship. Remember again the words of our Lord Jesus. Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. What a, what a picture. Saul persisting that he's been rebellion. And then his, 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 quote, repentance. Today the Lord has taken the kingdom from you. And he drops down to the ground and he starts to plead that that not be the case. And he rips Samuel's garment. He says, the kingdom's gone. God's going to give it to somebody else. Whereas, here is the character of God. If... When Samuel pointed out his disobedience, Saul had fallen in that moment. God would have been gracious. But you see, it was the rebelliousness. It was the stubbornness. It was his refusal to repent that caused the Lord to make the changes that he did. Are we able to hear the Holy Spirit and rightly perceive the falsity in the church 
and determine in our spirits that we will not fall prey to it. That we won't yield to it. You know what one way we yield to this more quickly than any other? Most, of, well, I won't say most of us. Many of us, I say us here in the room today, and I think this is a fair assessment. Let me know on the way out if you think it's wrong and we can talk about it. We're not typically in danger of stubbornness and rebellion. That's usually not what most of us would fall into here, I don't think. I don't think that's the case. Praise the Lord, right? Nobody's praising God over that. So maybe, maybe we are stubborn. Maybe, maybe we are like King Saul, right? I tell you, the, the bigger danger that we fall into, and it's what Jesus says to the church in Revelation 2, you tolerate you see, that's our danger. He says, I have this against you to the church of Thyatira. You tolerate that woman who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Remember that what John, uh, the Lord says to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 directly, he then communicates to, these, to those same churches as visions between chapter 4 and chapter 22. And so this woman Jezebel, this, this prophetess who's seducing God's people into immorality is depicted as this woman with finery on the back of a beast in Revelation 17. And the problem is toleration. Now how does God burn out of us improper toleration? You see, when you have a child and you're out working in the, in, in the garden, where's my, their gardener? There's a the gardener over here. You're out working in the garden and you say to the little child, hey, go get me a glass of water. And the five-year-old, you know, lumbers into the kitchen and gets the dirty, the dirty cup they drank out of that morning that still got their Kool-Aid custard, crusted around the, the rim and the particles from their, their, their you know, return backwash into that glass. They fill it up with tap water and they bring it out to you and you say, thanks. You can go back inside. But now if your 10-year-old does that, if the child who knows better does that, and you tolerate it, parents, don't, let, don't tolerate things from your children. As a matter of fact, what you expect is what you will get. If you expect them to behave a certain way in certain places, they will. Because part of your expectation is you, one, verbally communicating that, and then, two, setting in the disciplinary boundaries that it will happen. And they will do everything they can, especially in the first five and six years of their life, to see if you're serious. If you don't make them be quiet, they won't be quiet. If you don't make them learn, and learn to sit still, they won't learn to sit still. And I can tell you there's a big difference between toleration and the kind of passivity that we engage in when toleration is something based upon the capacity of what can be done. You see, Saul had been given the Spirit. Saul is the only person in the Old Testament that we are told who received a new heart to become a new man. The Bible doesn't even say that about David. Saul was giving something so profoundly life-altering, and then he turned on it and insisted that he was right. We fall into toleration, so we don't enact discipline in our own hearts, on ourselves, or on the people around us through godly exhortation. I don't mean you walk around Bible-thumping people. How does God burn that toleration, the false toleration, how does He burn it out of us? The desert. That's where He kills it. He led Israel into the wilderness for 40 years. Did he want to lead them in there for 40 years? No. He only wanted to take them in there for about two weeks, a couple months, long enough to get them through up to, Israel, up to the promised land to fight. But they didn't want to do it, and they displayed they didn't want to do it through their rebellion. When, when, when Christ calls Paul, Paul says in his letter to the Galatians that he went to Arabia. He went to the desert. So even Paul was led away to the desert by the Spirit for a season, 
for a few years, really, so God could burn out the false tolerations and work in him the kind of resiliency that he needed. Some of you are rebuking demons because you think it's the devil who's come to attack you, not perceiving it's the crucible of the desert that's to purge out of you a false toleration that would cause you to permit evil or to permit the kind of compromise that destroys so much of what the Lord wants to build in you. For time's sake, we're just going to go to point three. Alex will be speaking tonight at Vespers, a bit more directly, but less than five minutes. I, I've got to see that. I'm going to see you. I'm, there's somebody that needs to record this for me. Can we record that? Thank you. Point three is this. What is the other attribute of the, the influence, influence of this unholy triad? It's a crossless Christianity of means and influence. It's a crossless Christianity. Matthew 16, the Lord says that we've got to daily take up our cross and follow Him, to deny ourselves and follow Him. Daily taking up the cross is the crucible of the wilderness. It is the mortification of our living. I got this cross the other day. I've been wanting it. can't really see it. And they sent me with a beautiful chain. The problem is, the chain puts it up here, so I can't see it. And I don't wear this for you to see it. I wear it for me to see it. There's a difference. Um, this is John, John Paul II, uh, a, a crucifix, where Christ is depicted as dead. So he's not like on the cross. He's on the cross. He's hanging from it. So I have it there so I can look down at it and I can say, live dead. Daily take up the cross. Your life isn't yours. It's been hidden with Christ in God. Do what He wants. Your soul is at stake. When our Christianity is crossless, it's not Christianity. Paul says that their God is destruction, their, their bellies are their God's. Their end is destruction. Their, their God is their belly because the cross is their enemy. They're enemies of the cross, but they're pro-Jesus. How is the Lord going to cause the church to overcome the gates of hell and not be overcome by it? Because we are united to Him. We are suffering with Him. And we are dying as martyrs, whether that is through the heroic saintliness of our normal living or through the shedding of our blood. That's how he's displaying his resurrection. How does he overthrow this unholy triad in the book of Revelation? How does he contend against the falsities in the church and the false churches? How does he do this? One, through his word. When you read the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, the Lord speaks with a scalpel level of precision that makes many contemporary ears uncomfortable. Jesus, why can't you just go along to get along? Why can't you just give us blessings? Why can't you, in the words of the prophets, just prophesy more beer and wine and comfortable couches? And it's because the Lord loves us. It's because He's laid down His life for us. He speaks that way to call us to himself, not because he delights in the wounding, but because the wounding is what we already are, and the word is the light that reveals that's what we are, so that in his light then we can be healed. And here we are in the middle of Lent, wearing rose. It's a cause to rejoice, my friends. If you're finding your soul is particularly afflicted, rejoice. Not because of the affliction, but because hopefully the fastings that you're engaged in and the service that you're doing that's out of step with your normal schedule is causing you to really reckon with how you can love the Lord. And that means learning how to sit in His presence 
and let him love you. Because it's when you're pressing near to him that you suddenly discover he wasn't far away to begin with. And that it's in his presence and in the comfort of his presence that he envelops you with himself and protects you from these diabolic influences. And I don't know about you, but I find that to be a great cause of rejoicing. Stand with me. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us to be those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Help us to be protected by that archangel that wars on behalf of your people. Help us to join that woman who was given wings and fled into the desert and was protected. Help us to be on that side of the earth where it opens and swallows the river from the dragon's mouth. Help us to be among those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Dispel the enemy and his lies from our hearts, O God, and let us rejoice that You have given us Yourself the very bread of heaven. In Christ's name. Amen. Please remain standing as